is Experiments in Digital Storytelling. I am Maggie Barbara Bosselman and I work with Culture Hub. Um, Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Experiments in Digital Storytelling, presented to you by Culture Hub and La Mama. This is a new program that we've developed to test emerging technologies to see how we can create meaningful stories, meaningful experiences, um, and really reach each other through these new sources and platforms. Um, so today we have an open rehearsal with uh, the whole team from Double I Studios. Um, we feel like opening up the process to the audience is really important at this point because there are so many minds working in so many different directions to figure out just how to do this thing, which they're trying to do, which is VR theater. Um, so today you're going to see from actors, from directors, from writers, from producers, from technologists, um, and we're going to get to hear from all of those perspectives about what this collaboration is like and how 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 we're doing it. Um, this is also leading up to a. Uh, longer performance that they're going to do in May, um, and that's a, a, called Pandora X, um, which the director, Kira Benzing, will tell you lots more about. Um, tonight, now, we are using Live Lab, which is, um, this is how we're connecting to everybody in, in all the different locations, because obviously we're all distributed across many different locations. So Live Lab is an experimental software that Culture Hub is developing to create a place where artists, audiences, technologists can come together and collaborate and perform. Uh, so you're, we're also bringing VR chat, which is the venue that that um, Double I is using. So we have a lot going on. We might have some technical difficulties at some certain moments. We did this afternoon, which is par for the course. That's a, kind of a good thing if we're breaking things, because then we'll figure out how to fix them and push them harder next time. So um, glad you're here. I'm Maddie uh, with Culture Hub, and I'm now handing it over to Kira Benzing with WA Studios. Thanks, Maddie. Hi, live audience. Thank you for being here with us tonight as we test the second round of this grand experiment. These really are experiments in, in digital storytelling and storytelling and virtual storytelling and all of these formats that we're layering and collaging and mashing together to see what we can do. And yes, we expect things to break. And if they do, we're gonna look at that as an opportunity because it means we're learning something from what we're doing. So if we disappear, if our audio stops, you know, stick with us, hang in there, we'll be back because um, we're New Yorkers and we want to stop. <laughs> and so today we're really going to show you this open rehearsal. We're going to open the doors to our process. We're in a very learning kind of place. We are in a really experimental um, new place where we are just trying things. We are going to run some scenes from a production that we did at the Venice International Film Festival, this production called Love Seat. We're gonna bring in our actors from across the country for that. Um, and that will be partially in VR and it will also be live here. This is all intended to be done at the downstairs theater space with La Mama and Culture Hub. And that was supposed to be for a live audience as well as for a virtual world and VR audience. But everything has changed. The state of the world has changed and now we're changing our format to reach you digitally so you are our new live audience and we are just so excited for you to be here and for us to define what it means to have seats anymore to gather to be a community to experience and watch together in the middle of tonight we are going to run an experiment with you and so for those of you watching on facebook we need you to add your comments we're going to be asking questions and we're going to take those comments and we're going to turn them into this beautiful word collage, this word cloud collectively together as an audience. And then we're going to go and show you a kind of flash forward of where we're going with a scene from Pandora X, which is totally new. We've 3D modeled a new environment. Our actor just got the text a few days ago. So it's a, we're in a really 
new space together and we're going to learn together and in order to get started we want to show you the trailer from love seat so you can get an idea of what we performed at the venice film festival in this beautiful medieval building that actually housed um, a hospital to treat lepers and victims from the plague so you will actually see this incredible quarantine space that was converted into a space for art for, for turning something that had uh, a group of people that cared about other people you know coming together to care for the sick in these times so take a look at this trailer with us and see into the space where we came up with some some new uh, methods in storytelling. That's amazing. I've never met anyone like you, perfect partner. You're know, like an electric blanket plugged into the sun. I will transform into a colossus of organization to protect you, my shield of preparedness. Let's fly. No. Don't fly the perfect partner over a portal to another dimension. Are you nuts? Walking where no bee ever has. Huh. But he landed anyway. The fresh chance to pair an ordinary someone with the perfect partner. I see a, a face that's still ready to just jump into the unknown and witness nature's like chaotic wonders with exhilaration instead of fear. Keeping a thing in maintenance. That is a daily, hourly battle against every force that exists. If you saw your perfect partner sitting in that chair, what would you see? So that is a look back at where we have been and what we performed at the Venice International Film Festival. And we really, did that production in record time. We assembled all of that in about six weeks of time from the writing of the show with writer Mac Rogers, playwright Mac Rogers, the casting of the production to the two actors you see above me on the screen, Jen Harris, who joins us from New York City, who originated the role of Abby in Love Seat, and Jonathan David Martin, who joins us from across the country in Los Angeles, who originated the role of Bruce. And we did everything from writing this production to casting it, to 3D modeling, designing our set, two of everything. You can think about this production had a real world version of everything and a virtual world version of everything, a live physical set and a virtual set, live physical blocking and virtual blocking where Jen would even fly through the air 30 feet above the virtual stage. Um, and so we're gonna take you into the middle of this show where we have this scene about the, the two characters are competing for the love of this perfect partner, which happens to be represented by an empty chair. And in this production, there are these strong undercurrents of these themes about emptiness and loneliness and connection, which we just thought was completely apropos for the time that we are in right now. So, Jen and Jonathan, we're going to start with the scene and we'll just run it um, a little differently than we did in Venice. Jen, you'll run to camera to the audience and, and I know that you were working with the audience live, actually getting you know pretty close to them and, and working across the stage. And Jonathan, you were in VR convincing the VR audience about why you should be in love of the perfect partner. So I'm going to give you guys your cue from the host line and We'll just jump right in. And so the host is telling them, okay, Bruce, you're going to go for the virtual audience. Abby, you've been assigned to the live audience. And he says, let the interviews begin. Look, 
There's the reason I chose these over lovers. I've dated a lot of mediocre people in my life. Weak people, unimaginative people, or the total opposite, the controlling people who wanted my life to match theirs. I kept on believing and I kept on being let down until I made a momentous decision for myself. I'm leaving the game forever. I'd rather be lonely than disappointed. And I stuck to that decision for years. For me to go back on that now, it would have to be someone amazing. Well, the perfect partner is that amazing. And you better believe, I'm not gonna let Bruce stand in my way. I'm not here to make friends. And there's nothing I won't do to win this game. Okay. Of course, it would be Abby who would be trying to ruin things for me. It, it, it's been that way since she moved in here two years ago. I'm always trying to act like I'm the one with the problem. Oh, don't you like bees, Bruce? Don't you like honey? Well, you know what? Actually, I don't. It's thick, it's sticky, and it gets into every nook and cranny. Now, every time I try to establish some exquisite order in this building, she comes along and pours that stuff all over it. But I never thought she would try to drip her beeswax over my one chance of happiness. And hey, not just mine, I mean the perfect partners too, because I know they would be happier with me. I'm not here to make friends, and she is not the only one with a sting in her tail. Nice guys, it's really fun. Um, and I know that you're both performing in such different ways right now through this new medium. Jen, I want to say to you, maybe you want to, you know, start a little bit further back or even standing. I don't know if you want to try that and just kind of use your space. You know, when we did this in Venice, you had the opportunity to kind of walk across the stage. So just feel free, how, whatever that means to you to kind of use your space more. Sure. Cool. Yeah, I can still see you. That's great. Okay. And Jonathan, I think the same thing, but virtually use your space more, you know, because we don't have Abby's avatar in there, like feel free to use the whole stage. Feel free to jump into the audience if you want, uh, surprise an audience member and, and try to convince them. Okay, guys, I'm gonna give you a cue whenever you're ready. And so the host basically says, let the interviews begin. Look. There's a reason that I chose these over lovers. I've dated a lot of mediocre people in my life. Weak people, unimaginative people, or like the total opposite controlling people who wanted my life to match theirs. I kept on believing and I kept on being like them. So I made a momentous decision for myself. I'm leaving the game forever. I'd rather be lonely than disappointed. And for me to go back on that now, I mean, it would have to be someone amazing. Well, a perfect partner it is that amazing. You better believe I'm not gonna let Bruce stand in my way. I'm not here to make friends. And there's nothing I won't do to win this game. Of course, it would be Abby who's trying to ruin this for me. I mean, it has been that way since the moment she moved in here two years ago. But she, she's always trying to act like I'm the one with the problem. What's wrong with these, Bruce? Don't you like honey? Well, you know what? No, I don't. It is thick, it is sticky, and it gets into every nook and cranny. And every time I try to establish some exquisite order in this building, and she comes along and she pours that stuff all over it. You know, I never thought that she'd try to ruin my one chance of happiness. And I mean, not just mine, you know, the, the perfect partners too, because I know that I can make them the happiest. I'm not here to make friends. And she is not the only one with a thing in her tail. <laughs> That's great, guys. And I can even see that our virtual camera even got up there close to when you approached that virtual audience member. So that's a, a nice little intimate moment there you got to have. So really fun, guys. And I'm going to jump forward in the script to scene eight, which is later on in the production. It's this 
moment where the characters have actually gone through a lot of competing with each other. They've they've tried all kinds of things. Abby's transformed based on what the audience votes on. She either turns into a croissant or into a marshmallow. Um, there's one other character you've turned into. Now that I'm uh, I'm trying to remember. Oh, a Christmas tree. It was a Christmas a tree. Christmas tree. <laughs> I think Marshmallow was always the audience favorite. And then Jonathan's character, Bruce, has transformed into enormous heights. He's done all kinds of things to, uh, to try to win the love of the perfect partner, these magical feats that, of course, could only happen in a virtual reality scenario. And now these characters have a, a more real moment where they are discovering that what they're seeing in the chair is different for each of them. The perfect partner actually appears differently to them. And so I'm going to let them take a moment here. And Abby, we'll start with you. We'll start with your character, Jen. Okay. No, Abby, well, I don't see a beard. Whenever you're ready. Well, I don't see a beard. What I see is the clean, careless face. An earnest face. A face that so ready to believe anything. A face that hasn't learned the habit of smearing. A face that still doesn't know what kind of adult it wants to be and is open to deciding that in tandem with someone else. A face that's ready to plunge into the unknown and looks at nature's chaotic encounters with exhilaration. Instead of fear, a face that turns every corner expecting to see something amazing instead of a fix in the teeth. A face that thinks that shadows hide treasures instead of flaws. A face worth breaking a promise to make to yourself for. A face worth giving up on giving up for. It's weird. What is? Uh, I can see it while you say it. I mean, while you say those words, I can see it. But then it goes back to. What you see, which is what? Well, um, there's the beard, of course, but it, it's not about the beard. It's, it's about all the beard type things that I see there. What's a beard type thing? Uh, well, it's a thing that you can make perfect, but it'll never stay that way. Meaning that it will always need maintenance and someone that wants to do that maintenance. Because if you think about it, maintenance is the hardest thing to do on this earth. I mean, you know, soaring above and chanting cloud leaves, that only takes a moment or two, but Keeping those hedgerows trimmed when all they want to do is grow. I mean, that, that is a whole life's work. Maintenance is, is a daily, hourly battle against every force that exists, against disrepair, dirt, grease, danger, aging, against time. Keeping a thing in a state of organization and cleanliness, it is creative. It's quixotic. It's it's standing up in the face of decay and saying everything you tried to accomplish today oh i rolled it right back you're gonna have to come back tomorrow and i mean maintenance is the battle that you always lose but it's a battle worth fighting and and you can create so much beauty while you're fighting and that's what i see the chance to take the maintenance that I've mastered in the rest of my life and bring it into love. And as you're saying it, I can see it. But as soon as I stop, the beard disappears and no mine again. Thanks guys. Thanks so much for trying that in this new format. I can see as you're both reaching through your computer screens to each other, Jen, let's just rework a little bit the top of your part, and Jonathan, I think we'll we'll hold in VR. If you want to come out of come out of headset, you're welcome to. Um, why don't you, Jen, 
let's pretend that both the chair and Jonathan and Bruce are right through the computer camera screen. Why don't you just give it straight to the audience here? Okay, okay. Well, I don't see a beard. What I see is a clean, hairless face, an earnest face, a young face, a face that's still ready to believe anything, a face that hasn't learned the habit of sneering, a face that still it doesn't know what kind of adult it wants to be, but is open to deciding that in tandem with someone else. A face that's ready to plunge into the unknown and look at nature's chaotic wonders with exhilaration instead of fear. A face that turns every corner expecting to see something amazing instead of a fist to see. A face that thinks that shadows hide treasures instead of claws. A face worth breaking a promise you made to yourself for. A face worth giving up on giving up for. Very cool. Well, thank you guys. That was really great. Nice to try it in this new format here with our digital and virtual audience. And we're gonna let Jonathan go off stage to transport from this love seat domain into a new domain, a new stage space, this Mount Olympus, where we have Pandora X taking place. Um, so I know he's gonna be flying through a portal pretty soon. I'll try and meet him there. And um, Jen and I are gonna try this audience test with you guys, this interactive experience. We're gonna bring up uh, a website called Slido, where we are going to be playing with um, these questions. And so you guys are gonna see them on, on Facebook. You guys can see these questions. Um, I'm gonna generate a question now. And this question is, describe the location of your last dream. And so for those of you on Facebook, if you can type into the comments, the location of your last dream, it can be a one word answer. It can be as detailed as you want it to be. You're just gonna drop that in and we're gonna see this generate and grow together. Jen, do you have a, a location of your last dream? Have you been able to dream recently? <laughs> uh, not so much recently, but I do know that uh, my last dream, I was in a street. Was it a beautiful, or was it a zombie filled, a zombie apocalypse street? <laughs> it was not a zombie apocalypse street. It was not a beautiful street. It was a very nondescript street. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the rest of the dream was more descript. We'll see. <laughs> That's great. We've got some some things coming in here right now. Um, Alyssa says a garden. Maura Donahue says a field. Oh, a bamboo grove. Oh my wow. gosh. Beautiful. Yeah. Yasmin says Egypt. Oh, I like wow. that. Getting out of New York. <laughs> Egypt. Wow, that's a descriptive name. Beautiful. All right. I'm going to, I see Jonathan's getting settled over there on Mount Olympus while we're running this. And I'm going to move us on to a new question with our audience. For those of you that remember this dream, do you remember what colors you saw in your last dream? I would say blue for me. I'll type it in. <laughs> Great. Blue. <laughs> blue looks popular. <laughs> what else? Any other colors? Black, red. I would say black and red. Michael says black and red. Hmm. Yeah. 
they must mean something. We're going to have to have a dream an analyst come on and tell us what, what everybody means. Daria says dark red. Dark red. That's very specific. Christopher Daw says technicolor. Cool. Alyssa says red. Yasmin says gray. Wow. Yasmin had gray, um, a gray Egypt. <laughs> You're tying those together. You can already see it. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, audience, I'm going to take us one final question here, which is really fun for VR, which is what superpower would you like to have? And of course, we have to ask this because it's possible to do anything in VR. A superpower. I'm going to... um. I'm going to predict we're going to get a lot of flying. <laughs> You've already um, been able to fly quite a bit. Yeah, I'm going to predict flying. Um, shape shifting. Oh, that's a good one. This is going to shape shifting. That's a very cool one. Also possible in VR. Turn into a croissant. Uh, Where did that come from? <laughs> from, from Lara. <laughs> uh, Yasmin says time travel. Oh, that's brilliant. That would be wonderful. That is a really good one. Alyssa says breathe underwater. Mm. Laura says, Laura Sweeney says invis invisibility. Visibility. Wow. Teleportation and visibility are popular amongst our audience tonight. Again, all things that can happen in VR. So we're gonna we're gonna think about exploring some of these in our show. So so thank you so much, live audience, for adding these thoughts, adding these elements of your dreams and the things you want to see and play with and we might be able to play with them in this production where you could actually do some of these things with us <laughs> telekinesis like graceland jennifer tucker um michael wood said it would be nice to time travel back to november 7th 2016. <laughs> <laughs> that's very specific it's well yeah <laughs> It was a better date. It was a better date. <laughs> the world was a different place then. Yeah, I wonder what um, Slido would generate if you put that entire sentence in there. <laughs> if you put time travel, if you just put November 7th, 2016 into Slido, what would that generate? <laughs> you shall have to see. Just a little bit. <laughs> Apparently nothing. Oh, I just see a change. <laughs> well, great. Thank you all for trying this experiment with us. I really appreciate all of these responses. And Jen, thank you for being so candid as well and contributing your dream to our dream study here. And now we're going to take things over to Mount Olympus. And Jonathan is embodying this character of Zeus. He's going to be wearing an avatar that is not custom for our production. It is uh, something that we found in the many VR chat domains of avatars that you can explore and try on and transform into. And it's something that we thought we'd play with for right now, but it is not forever. So we will be making custom art for this production. And if any of you are 3D modelers and character designers, uh, give us a holler because we would love to collaborate with you. So there's Jonathan, he's waiting at the top of this temple in Mount Olympus. And this is uh, an exploration coming from this new production that we're working on about the myth of Pandora. It's called Pandora X. Uh, we'll talk some more about that later in the Q&A. And Jonathan's just gonna try this out. And he's, you know, just trying out these lines. He got this text a few days ago. Mark Sternberg built Mount Olympus for us a few days ago. So everything is really new. 
Um, I'm going to be, you know, potentially on book for Jonathan if he needs a line. So Jonathan, just call line. And we're really going to rehearse this in front of you and see what happens. So Jonathan, whenever you're ready. Satyrs and nymphs of the forests and streams, muses of Greece who give glory through song, goddesses, gods, awake from your dreams. Come hither, come nigh, and join the throng. I, the great Zeus, do so command. Mine is the power to make a man strong. I humble the proud and raise up the obscure. Whomsoever shall call me wrong will suffer my vengeance, swift and sure. I, the great Zeus, do so command. Hephaestus. 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 Attend to me now, Hephaestus, the sculptor. Come, Aphrodite, of beauty untold. Athena, bring now your wisdom and valor and Hermes, your voice strong and bold. Are you here? I feel you near. Lend me your ears and eyes, my friends and allies, for the time has come to strike again, to shatter with fear the hearts of all men. Prometheus! Did you think my vengeance forgotten? That your misbegotten act would be lost in the mists of Mount Olympus? Do you not recall the destruction and danger? The thunder, the bolts of anger, which from my hand rained down upon the heads of man. A plague upon you for stealing fire. A plague on all men who embrace their desire. And by that blessed object shall know a fate most abject, living in misery, bereft, without a shred of hope left. Did you think I would forget my sacred vow? That the passage of time would efface it somehow? Nothing is forgotten. Wow, Jonathan, you made it. You didn't even call for line. <laughs> I, I surprised myself, that was <laughs> So, Jonathan, why don't we go back to the top of the temple, if mm -hmm. you can locomote back up there and uh, virtual cameras if you guys can reset to your starting positions. And I'm just gonna play with a very, very opening passage with you. Great. Really, uh, you know, satyrs and nymphs, and why don't you just do that, like those first four lines up to I the great Zeus do so command mm -hmm. and just try out a couple different avatars, just cycle through some things like maybe try on a more feminine type avatar and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Try on a taller or a shorter avatar. Right. Just cycle through, you know, one or two or three different avatars and just run those, that, for, that very first passage. You don't have to come uh, down to the dais, just stay up there and, and try this sort of avatar cycling from up there. Satyrs and nymphs of the forest and streams, muses of Greece who give glory through song, goddesses, gods, awake from your dreams. I come hither, come nigh, and join the throng. I, the great Zeus, do so command. What you see there, audience, is Jonathan is trying on another one, pulling another one up. 
Great, jump right into it. Satyrs and nymphs of the forest and streams, muses who give glory through song, goddesses, gods, awake from your dreams. Come hither, come thy and join the throng. I, the great Zeus, do so command. Go for it. Satyrs and nymphs of the forest and streams, Muses of Greece who give glory through song. Goddesses, gods, awake from your dreams. Come hither, come now, and join the throng. I, the great Zeus, do so command. That's great, Jonathan. And we could talk about that later, how that felt trying all those different avatar bodies on and what happens to yourself, your own physical body as you're doing this, what happens to your mind as you're doing this. So thank you for making those changes. And, and Jonathan's going to come out of headset. We're going to come out of Mount Olympus. Um, thank you so much, digital audience, for joining us there. We're going to jump into a Q&A. And so for those of you on Facebook, if you've got questions for us, drop them into the comments now because we will get to them in one of these sections for sure. We're gonna bring on the Love Seat team first, the creative team. So Jen is going to come back to the digital stage. Mac Rogers, our playwright, is going to join us. And Nick Fortuno, our moderator, who is the founder of Playmatics and a game designer and creative himself. He is going to be moderating and asking us some questions. And so it looks like we've got Mac here on the digital stage and we're going to be bringing in Nick and Jen will come back to us. And so for those of you on Facebook, you can drop in questions that you might have for Mac about how someone writes for VR and anything for the actors that you've got questions about. And I'm sure Nick will have questions for us too. Uh, great. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be part of this. It's a fascinating piece that's got a lot of like really interesting, uh, I think really interesting technical components and really interesting intersection of technology and other kinds of performance. Um, so I guess I want to start just by asking like how this works generally, like what's the, what, like how is it put together and, and what are the different pieces that are coming together to make this possible? Uh, so you know what, Nick, that is a really great question. And I feel like I'm actually going to save that one for Mark on our tech team when we bring them in in just a bit. Um, I mean, I can answer that in kind of brief, but he will do an even better, more technical job than I will. But, you know, we are using virtual reality with social VR. We're using a platform called VR Chat. We are typically in our the theatrical stage productions, we are using multiple projection screens. At Culture Hub, they have this incredible array that we just fell in love with where we had three screens side by side. And we were going to do something similar in a triptych display um, at the La Mama theater space. And here we're trying all of these projection screens and these really mini quadrants right now, as you can see, uh, through this kind of multicam viewing. So, so can you talk a little bit um, generally from like a creative perspective about what's interesting about the intersection of these things for you? You know, because um, a lot of a lot of what we think of as VR is often a very isolated experience. It's often an unsocial experience, and I'm not sure that a lot of people are familiar with the trend in VR to like bring actors into the space and to to actually have um, you know kind of a social experience in in this in this virtual reality. So, can you? Talk a little bit about what interests you, like as creatives, what interests you about this work and what, what do you find compelling about it? I can, definitely. Um, 
I mean, for me, the importance of theater is always to be gathered in community, to be watching something with other people, to be sitting alongside people, gasping in moments and crying in moments and holding my breath, um, feeling like I'm connected to the actors that are on the stage and we're all breathing the same air together. There is something about this sense of presence and realness and living in the moment and, and something about truth that happens in those spaces. And I'm curious if we can create that in a virtual space bring an audience, bring actors all together onto this three-dimensional platform and see if we can get to the same place of meaning and truth together. But maybe that's also a good one for Mac too about mixing these things. Yeah, this, it's interesting. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, when when Kira first approached me about about doing the project, uh, I was like, I, I was like, I, I seem like a really weird fit for this because I've mostly done theater. I've written some audio recently, but I've mostly written for live theater. And I was sort of making the mistake of thinking, okay, well, VR is the thing that's even more cutting edge than, or it's even newer than film or television. And I made the mistake of thinking that the newer something is, the further away from theater it must be. But actually, uh, uh, in the process of saying, well, okay, well, how is this going to work? What exactly are you interested in me writing? And the more that Kira described the process that she envisioned, the more it became clear. No, actually, this is a, this is a, a, a close cousin of theater. This is a, 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 the, 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 she, she was very much describing a live event, just one that could be experienced from more perspectives. Um, I remember when I went in to go watch the rehearsals when they would actually. Uh, uh, when the actors were in the helmets and they, they actually had uh, this, the, the VR uh, landscape up on a big screen behind them, I found something absolutely riveting about being able to go back and forth uh, between the live performers and, uh, 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 and their sort of avatar manifestations. Um, and, you know, it was, I found it sort of thrilling, the idea that some people would be actually in the room there in Venice watching their bodies uh, uh, and that other people around the world would be watching uh, uh, how those bodies were being uh, reflected and amplified in the virtual characters. Um, so it, there, uh, there definitely was a steep learning curve. It was a medium I had never written before, but uh, in a way I wasn't completely unprepared for it because it did kind of feel like writing a piece of theater. Just a piece of theater that you could access in a lot more ways than I was used to in my little you know, modest black box work uh, in downtown New York. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually. I'm really curious about that intersection. Actually, personally, it's like something that I find really fascinating. Is that like as I've looked at VR and I've seen that you know the trend of VR was to come at it from a film perspective. That was sort of like one of the big ways that VR was approached. But the more that people have been doing it, the more they've been realizing that theater and immersive theater are actually better analogs for what goes on, and it, it's been leaning more in that direction. So I, I'd be curious to hear more from from you know people who are writing for the space and people who are acting in the space, um, you know, and, and obviously the people here <laughs> to that end, um, you know, like what the experience was like for you, and did it resemble theater the way you understand your practice in theater? Like, was this acting like theater? Was this writing like theater? Or where were the differences and where were the surprising similarities? Uh, actors, you want to go first, or I, I don't care. What, uh, I'll start. I'll start. Uh, just say with the just with the writing side of it, and then I'll I'll kick it to the uh, to the actors. Uh, um, it's uh, I I when 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 I was first talking about the cure, I said like I don't even know what format this is. I don't even know what the words are supposed to look like on the page to write a, a piece of VR. I was like I don't even. Um, what is even, is there an accepted format for it? And she said, don't think about it like that. Think about writing a play where kind of more things are possible. Uh, they can kind of sprout into whole new directions. Um, you know, we, so we, uh, we sat down and, and kind of figured it out. We kind of figured it, a lot of the conversation about it was like a play. I wrote it in the same format that I use to write plays as opposed to when I'm writing for audio or for television or film. I use my stage play format. It's just that the stage directions in italics which normally say something like, you know, Fred goes up the stairs, uh, 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 Wilma sits on the sofa, was suddenly uh, uh, Bruce grows 30 feet high. 
uh, 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 you know, um, uh, Abby takes on one of the forms that the audience voted on, like the kinds of things that like the kinds of things I would be hesitant to write if I was writing a really well-funded Broadway show, I still wouldn't write some of those things. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and so get it, I, I guess the biggest hurdle for me was getting over that hump of don't, Stop with my usual self-censorship, my self-limitation of only these things are possible. So, so try really hard to stay within these parameters and kind of like let myself imagine the walls falling away and there being tons of new space uh, uh, to work in. Although I will say the one little thing I learned about it, uh, if I ever write uh, uh, for VR again, and I hope I will, um, I probably make the dialogue a little bit easier to memorize because I definitely felt bad in rehearsal. I was watching the actors, and um, when you're rehearsing VR and you've got the helmets on, you cannot hold your script for a week and a half. Most of us learn our lines by holding the we, you, you, the first week and a half of rehearsal. You got the script in your hand, and you're sort of learning the lines without even knowing that you're learning them. And then, and then by the time you need to be off book, you're kind of partway there. That's not a thing with VR. I was watching them in the helmets. I was going, if I ever do that again, I'm going to take it way easier on them with the memorization. Uh, but I'll kick it to the actors now. I'll go. Um, I actually, there are many, there are many directors who, uh, who, pref who, who try, try to encourage actors to come into rehearsal off book. So that's actually not the worst thing in the world. And. <laughs> And dialogue's fine. I mean, the monologues, I think Jonathan and I are, are used to learning monologues and doing them. So I I think you can take a deep breath. It's okay. But it was something in the first week. I remember we were like, oh, we can't hold our script. And there was a lot of eating. So I did feel like there was a lot. I mean, the rehearsal process, it just was, and the performing, it just is more technical because you're dealing with technology and your face and your hand and right in front of you. But, um, and I don't know, like, it kind of reminded me, like, when you were talking just now, Mac, about when you write or read an for animation, it's like, yeah, then the, like, tree can grow, and then the, the cat can blow up. Nothing against, you know, blowing up cats. But, you know, any anything can sort of happen. And in acting and doing, like, voiceover work for animation, you don't ever get to, like, someone animates and... And then that happens. And of course, our avatars are made by artists and creators, but then we got to control those avatars, which is what you do in VR. But to, do, to get to do that live on a stage in front of people, it was just, um, it just was something so new and exciting. It was, just, it was like how performing live theater is a little bit scary it got to be a little bit scary because the technical things might not work. And then what do you do when that happens? Or what do you do when you walk out of your square, which I think I did once, and like hit something. <laughs> or we had people watching us. But, so there's like technical stuff that was a little like, oh, I hope this works. But there was something really, and the similarities, there, there were a lot. We actually did blocking our avatars. We had our stage and we, we figured out our avatars blocking and in, in relation to Jonathan and I in relation to each other and the other things on the set that made up the set. So we did have blocking. And then once I was in there, I and I saw my avatar and I saw Jonathan, I saw our set, it kind of felt like the same thing to me in a way. Yeah. To to jump on that, you know, one thing, Mac, that uh, you made me think of when you were describing the part in the show where uh, Bruce grows to like 30 feet tall is that you, if you were to do that on stage, you would have, you know, you, you would have to figure out some way to do that with, so that the actor's embodied and you're actually going 30 feet up in the air, right, so that that effect would work. And in film, you would probably do that with effects after the fact and the actor you know, you're you're probably in front of a green screen and you're really just imagining it. And what's fascinating about how we did it in the show is, oh, I've got the experience of actually changing my point of view and becoming a 30 foot tall version of this character. So in a weird way, um, it, it, it's almost, there are moments where it becomes more real for the actor, more uh, realized than certainly than if you're doing film and, and in, in a lot of ways more than you're doing uh, the experience that you have when you're in theater. Um, and one way that it was really different than I think either uh, film or theater is the fact that 
uh, especially, and this is really particular to Love Seat, we had the opportunity to perform on two stages for two audiences at the same time. So there was the actual stage in Venice, where our audience is there, and then there was the virtual stage where the avatars and the virtual set was living, and then a virtual audience. And you know, we had two sets of blocking. I had physical blocking um, on the actual stage, but then I also had blocking for Bruce the avatar in VR. And so there's this really sort of fun game of uh, doing two things at once um, that was really, really uh, new and kind of an exciting challenge to master. Yeah, I mean, I think that that idea of two stages, like two simultaneous stages, is like one of the most interesting things about the piece because it it um it not only like kind of requires this like I can see this kind of bifurcated understanding of your own performances and and how this is being perceived, but it also means that you're sort of trying to read two things at the same time, you know, and like and being responsive to those things. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about like what that experience is like and you know you know given that this is something that you know a in the context we're in right now is going to probably be happening things like this are going to be more common where you're you're trying to interface with through a digital platform but also you know pieces that have blend this mixed reality are going to be more common can you talk a little bit about like like how what was that experience like and like what was that like patting my head and rubbing my stomach at the same time sensation Jonathan, you want to go first? <laughs> sure, I'll, uh, sure. Um, it's uh, it reminded me a little bit actually of the experience that I've had when I've uh, been a puppeteer, um, and that I have an awareness of both my body as the performer, but also the the puppet's body and the mm -hmm. puppet's life and its agency as a character and what I'm trying to express um, through. The, the character, the puppet, puppet, but also knowing that I'm a part of that as well. Um, and just like in puppetry, you know, you're far portraying one character. So I'm, I'm both Bruce on the actual stage and in the virtual stage, just as when I'm you know, a puppeteer, I'm, I'm, you know, we're, we're creating one kind of character. Um, so it reminds me a, a, a bit about that, but I think the other element is that um, there's a, there's a huge amount of trust that I know that for myself, I was placing on um, our digital camera people um, who are in the virtual world and who are capturing what the audience is seeing of of Bruce um, from that point of view. And uh, you know, you don't really have that experience very often on stage unless you're using a lot of uh, live camera work on stage. Um, and so that was kind of a, a unique thing to um, to sort of balance uh, those two experiences as as an actor of you know, trusting that the you, you're playing to the camera, but you're also playing to an audience that's with you. Yeah, I would say along with that, with the whole, the thing that was a little pat my head, rub my stomach was, we were um, on a stage with a live audience. You couldn't move too far because of the parameters of the VR. And then also inside on our live stage, um, in VR, we had cameras, so it was kind of like blocking for camera. So it's a little like working in television, working in theater. It was a little bit of both, and also sort of making sure that like your avatar was not was was calibrated. <laughs> Sorry, that's what calibrated means, or this is what uncalibrated means. Um, so it's just sort of check. There's like like Jonathan was saying. There's just a, there's more. There's just a sense of awareness that you had to have, that that I had to have. That seemed just a li a lot more focused and acute than on a stage when you didn't have to worry about those extra elements. But also the thing that's sort of very interesting about that is it forces it forces me to be a lot more specific about certain things. So, um, you know, a little, you know, like one move of the avatar's head or one something, I knew that it was on a big screen that the audience could see that. So on the stage, um, if I just did like one move with my head, I knew what was behind me on a big screen and my avatar was just doing one move. And that's going to visually be um, a more prominent picture than watching like a character on stage do that move. So, it was, it felt, you know, it felt also like just visual art as well, like moving visual art. And it was, it was very fun, it was very fun. So 
I'm kidding. Uh, I like from the studio that we have to move on to the tech team now. But for anyone who's been asking questions on Facebook, leave those in the comments and we'll get back to you for sure. We'll leave answers there. And so we will be playing a piece of video art from filmmaker Michael Woods, something that we showed in our AR installation. And we will be transitioning Jen and Mac and Jonathan off stage and bringing on the tech team from both Love Seat and Pandora X Productions. Thank you all. Thank you, Matt. We have now brought to the digital stage here the tech team behind the production of Love Seed and Pandora X. In our top right corner, we have Chris DePino, one of our technical producers. In the bottom left, we have Laura Bucare, creative producer, Mark Sternberg, technical producer, and Chris Dawes, producer, production manager, and of course, Nick, our moderator. So, Nick, back to you. Great. So, I, I think. Uh... I think we should just start by talking about like, okay, like how, what, what is this technically and how, you know, how does it make possible the, the kind of like multiple, uh, multiple versioned and live and social experience that, that was, that we all witnessed. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we're, for the moment we're relying on other platforms. Um, initially when we did this, we were using high fidelity. Um, now we're using VR chat. They're both similar they're in that they're like game environments that uh, allow you to sort of uh, use your VR headset, track certain elements, and then carry them over. Um, and uh, yeah, in that end, it's, you know, it, you can do, we've been doing performances that exist both in the virtual world and the real one, um, and sort of take elements of both and portray to both audiences. And we've actually found interesting ways uh, Kira came up with an idea for uh, what we would love to, to use like a webcam to show the virtual audience to the real audience and vice versa. So there was even like a video feed into the virtual space that connected the two audiences. Um, I think uh, one element that uh, that was very apparent uh, when you when you see the, the performance live is uh, that every uh, every virtual element, whether it's a camera or an actor requires that um, requires that the uh, that they be set up with their own computer rig, and the uh, that in this case that ended up being fourteen computers. Um, and uh, and a different person manning each one of those computers. Uh, so uh, you're you're not necessarily cutting down on on the amount of crew one might need to to pull something like this off. Uh, in fact, you're just putting a putting a giant computer on each crew member. <laughs> essentially, how it works out. Yeah, so I, it was, it's, inter it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because a, a question from from the feed has been about like whether any there was anything algorithmic going on in terms of how cameras were operated or if there was any artificial intelligence that was helping like make sense of what was going on in the in in the virtual space. And so, are you you know I'm, I, I think you're suggesting that that the answer to that question is no, <laughs> um, but I'm I'm curious I'm curious to hear like how much of it is like actually like a live camera crew like operating in the space and how much of it how much is the technology lifting some of that for you yeah we're, we're doing it live right now um what we did with love seat is initially it was we had 
uh, different locations that we could work to. Um, so that sort of captured, like we knew the blocking, we knew where people were going to end up. Um, so we could put camera angles where we needed to be at specific moments. Um, but yeah, in, in, AI is an interesting idea, but you know, one of the things you know is, you know, it's basically cinematography, right? Um, so at the end of the day, there is a certain creative element of how am I framing this camera? What is the camera angle saying about uh, what I'm seeing on screen? That, you know, an AI, yeah, you can probably trick an AI into constantly doing like rule of thirds, um, but to do something more complex, you know, uh, that was still a couple of years away at least. If I can jump in, I would say, you know, for people that are sitting at home and wondering about their industries, especially, especially the entertainment industry where it feels like things have halted, I see the potential for new jobs here for virtual cinematographers. I think that there is a, a possibility of a new kind of digital storytelling where we can be capturing an engine and exporting that for these other types of formats. So, so what does that mean uh, in terms of the production process that that you know you were you were moving? I mean, I think that I think that like, provides like this interesting lens on the whole piece, like sort of knowing how many people were involved and like how much like it's like you know computers you know interesting as analogs for people and like how much like okay, there's a lot of things coming together to make this piece happen and these pieces happen. So, how does that work as a technical production reality? Like, like, are is it? Um, you know, how are you prototyping in? What does the handshake look like? And 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 if it's or more maybe from the rehearsal side, like like is it something where the tech is ready and then you're bringing actors in? Is it something that's going hand in hand the entire time? Like, give, give us a lens on like what what like the the, the the development process looks like for something like this. Mark, you want to take that first? Yeah, yeah. So it, it um, I mean, it's it's a constantly iterative, iterative process. You know, we're constantly using new platforms, constantly seeing what they can do. The platforms themselves are constantly developing. Um, even for Love Seat, you know, we didn't use high fidelity straight out of the box. We used high fidelity plus a ton of code that gave us certain things that you know made our production run a whole lot more smoothly. Um, moving camera options, uh, mirrors for our actors so they could see their you know their avatars, calibrations, and stuff like that. Um, VR chat just like released, you know, a new uh, coding and scripting option uh, called Udon a couple of days ago. We haven't gotten a chance to play with that yet, but this is a constantly moving field. Even the platform we're using right now, uh, Culture Hub is, you know, creating this platform called Live Lab, which um, allows you to do uh, multi-layered streaming and stuff. And it's what we're using to actually stream all these, uh, sending all these streams together and then mixing them and sending them out to you. So it, you know, a lot of this stuff is brand new, cutting edge, and uh, you know, has its kinks, but we work it out, and you know, you get through it. And if I could add to that too, I think um, in in narrative storytelling, you're just constantly trying to find a way that technology as a medium can meet your needs for for getting that narrative across to people in a way that you you want it to. And I I know Kira can attest to this, but you're just constantly trying to use whatever tech is available to make that possible. So starting out in, in Venice, we had a couple snags based, you know, upon it being on a remote island. We had to kind of adapt with what tech we could use, um, creating a networked experience, and then, you know, having to use, use tethered headsets when initially we weren't going to. So you're constantly doing these things, whatever you can, to make it work. Um, we use HTC Vive trackers, too, to make sure we matched up well with the actors and that was corresponding well inside uh, the virtual space and for the remote audience to see as well. So you're just like Mark said, you're constantly iterating and, and doing what you can to make sure that that story is getting across. Yeah, uh, and uh, a, a real great deal of collaboration goes into this as well. And, and, and this whole field is so new right now that, you know, you really uh, you really have a lot of people, a lot of people uh, uh, donating their their brain space uh, to to help make things like this happen. And the you know the, in the early in the early rehearsals, uh, you know there before before I had ever stepped foot uh, in there, you know uh, a great deal of of uh, work had been done to figure out basically what direction this was going 
and um, and then during the during the rehearsal process, there was you know four uh, four of us on the technical side in in the actual rehearsal space working. Then at any given time, there might be three others um, outside of the rehearsal space that we're messaging with, and um, and then. A, a, on a daily basis, we would hit snags that uh, that would require yeah that basically would present questions that we don't that no one in that that group knows how to solve or or a script that's needed that no one uh, that no one is sure quite how to how to use and so there was outreach then to um, outside of that network um, and you know it was really actually. Uh, extremely impressive to um, to watch that unfold. Uh, how much help came from uh, from just other other creators around the world who uh, uh, who wanted to wanted to see this this move forward. I'm noticing we've got some questions from the Facebook group, and I think we can actually save uh, some of these acting questions for the next group of people, but. Just before we switch, um, Chris Gauze, I know you're newer to our production of Pandora X and our and our tech team. Um, we had a question earlier about how close this is akin to the film process. You know, are you finding from the film production world that what we're doing, at, you know, and as Nick was asking about, you know, are we working with the tech, innovating it before or at the same time? What do you see in terms of the parallels? Um, I see a lot of parallels. Um, a lot of it, personally, I find in theatrical, um, just because you're building the sets as well. So you're trying out, you know, a particular set and realizing maybe this doesn't work as well, or this needs to be foreshortened. And the advantage of virtual reality is you can change that in a matter of minutes, as opposed to having to, you know, tear the set down and rebuild it. And also with uh, film, especially a narrative film, you also could have sets or locations where you could have, you know, weather get in the way. So this is a much more controlled environment. You have a lot more flexibility over tailoring the environment and uh, creativity, as you said, you know, we're using sort of off the shelf avatars and environments in this rehearsal, but in our May performance, it'll all be um, custom artwork like uh, everyone saw in the Love Seat set that was all designed specifically for that performance. And you can tell um, Jonathan's avatar is very unique and the set is very unique. And we hope to do that with uh, Pandora X in May. So hope everybody can join us then and see how the whole production's evolved. Well, that's great. Thank you, guys. So, Nick, we're going to just transition. Uh, everyone from the tech team is going to go off stage. Nick and I are going to remain, and uh, we're going to play another piece of video art, some 16 millimeter shot art of uh, of an empty chair, to remind those of you that are feeling emptiness and loneliness again that we're here with you. This is some art that played in our augmented reality installation during the Venice Film Festival. It was projected on some pretty large screens in that very barren former hospital. So we'll be playing that while we transition the tech team off stage and bring on the Pandora X team in just a while.
in this final digital phase for the last leg of our Q&A. So again, for those of you asking Facebook questions, we're gonna to get to those. Uh, we've got Alyssa Landry in the bottom left quadrant corner, our writer of Pandora X and my longtime creative partner here with Double Eye Studios. And the bottom left, we have Jonathan David Martin, who you saw as Bruce and Zeus. Nick, back to you. Sure. Um, so I, I think, well, as, you know, as Kira suggested, we'll take it from um, one of the audience questions first uh, that on the feed, um, which is like, how do actor preparations change throughout the process as a result of like all of this? You know, we were just talking about like some of the some of what the technology is doing as the development is going on. How does it change being like actors in this space and working with actors in a, in a space like this? Like how, how do those things transform when you're dealing with this like kind of fusion with technology? Did you want to talk from the directing point of view or let me jump in? Jonathan, I think you can talk from the acting point of view. I would like sure. to hear. I would like to hear from you. Oh, you would like. Oh, great. Uh, all right. Um, I, I mean, you know, we talked a little bit about it earlier with Love Seat about how you know one of the sort of fundamental differences is you really uh, you really do want to start. You you want to have the lines in a place uh, where you can be in the headset um, and and not be thinking just about that technical part of it much earlier than you would in a theatrical. Uh, production and um, you know in a, in a way it's kind of like um, it's kind of like jumping into tech from day one uh, you know there it, for as an actor there's a way that rehearsals progress once you bring all of the design elements into the room lighting sound costumes etc when you're in a, a regular stage piece and uh, because of the nature of VR they're all there from day one and um, the upside of that is that as you get closer towards the actual production, there's not this huge shift where um, suddenly all of these new uh, costumes and lights and sound and all this other stuff is then added on to what you've been doing in the rehearsal room. And suddenly you're kind of creating a whole new production. At least it feels that way. Um, with this, it's actually in a way a lot more organic in that you're learning all of the technical parts of uh, of the role along with all of the um, you know, the creative actor parts of it in terms of just connecting with the person that you're talking with and um, figuring out the journey that your character goes on. Cool. Um, yeah, so I, I, I kind of want to ask again, you know, since, since uh, you know, like, like we, we can actually get different writer perspectives on this, like what was what was the writing process like and how how did it resemble like writing for things like theater or film and how was it different from from those processes well for pandora x we're really at the very very beginning of um of writing the story um the things that i've written for before one i'm, I'm coming from a world of immersive entertainment and also from um uh, narrative direction of a multiplayer VR game. So as I'm beginning to put the storyline into place, actually, we, Mac and I were talking about this backstage. Um, I'm, I'm imagining a, I guess, kind of a spreadsheet where in the middle you have the storyline that goes through. Uh, then on, on either side of that, you're trying to think, okay, what is the player what is the actor doing in real life what is he seeing is he in the virtual world is he in the real world or she and then for the live audience what are they seeing and what are they doing and for the virtual audience what are they seeing and what are they doing because you don't have just a linear storyline that you're playing to one audience as as everyone was mentioning earlier both audiences have to be given nourishment shall we say they have to be given something to see and our goal Kira and I uh, the goal that we have for this particular piece is that it will be very interactive so then that question is one you have to ask yourself for every scene um, obviously both audiences won't be able to do something in every single scene but that is in that case what are they seeing uh, if the virtual audience is doing something what is the physical audience doing or seeing at that time so it's like this huge puzzle piece as you're moving forward 
with your story outline, you're also trying to imagine what's happening in the virtual world and what's happening in the physical world. And as you imagine that, it ping pongs back into the way you're writing it. So for example, the monologue for Zeus, um, I wrote that first and then I started to fill in this little outline. And as I was filling it in, I started to think, oh, wouldn't it be cool if Zeus could throw thunderbolts? Um, so, oh, all of a sudden I think, okay, I'm gonna put that down as an idea. It's in the virtual world. He's throwing a, th throwing a thunderbolt. And yeah, because I'm imagining- cool. <laughs> and because I'm imagining Zeus as being a little bit, he's gone a little bit cuckoo because all of the other Greek gods have disappeared and only he is still there kept alive by his great grudge that he holds against Pandora and Prometheus. So he's imagining all these other gods and he's tossing his thunderbolts around, but he doesn't have very good aim. And so he has to say to one of the virtual audience members, hey, um, could you just like give me back that thunderbolt? Because, uh, sorry, my aim is a little off. Um, so then we, Kira and I have to imagine, okay, how can we make that happen? Can an audience member pick up the thunderbolt, give it back to Zeus? And then we go to the technical team and say, hey, can we do this thing with the Thunderbolts? <laughs> I mean, this is just like an example. I don't, we haven't even talked to them about Thunderbolts. They're probably off stage going, ah, no, Thunderbolts, what? <laughs> but anyway, it's a, they, I, I really, really enjoy thinking about all these different puzzle pieces and what, not just what is the storyline, but what, what are all the other elements that we have to think about to make it really fun for all members of the audience, whether they're in the virtual audience or the physical audience. And then that means that they can come back again. If they've been to the physical production, then they come back, can come back another time and join in on the social VR platform and have a totally different experience. Um, and we're trying also to leave a little bit of room for improvisation uh, so that no matter where, where you go in the, in the physical world or the virtual world, it will be a different experience each time you come to see the show. Yeah, so I mean, that's, how do you that's no, I mean, that's like a really, I, I think that's like, you know, it's interesting because I feel like there's a, there are these like hurdles in the, in the, in the work that are, that are like, like it's just making it harder and harder and harder to like, to, 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 to hold, right? Like, it's like, okay, we're going to do this on two places at once. And there's going to be interactivity in both places. And that interactivity has to be interesting for both audiences because both audiences are seeing that interactivity at the same time. So I guess I'm I'm curious as to like, and this is just, you know, as a as a kind of games and interactive narrative person, this is where my head always goes, is like, what how do you think about the interactions that can happen at both levels? And and like how do you how do you line up um how do you how do you answer questions about that like as as a viewed experience and a played experience, right? Because they're two different things, right? Like having a, an audience member do something that affects what's going on is different than an audience member watching an audience member do something that affects something that's going on. And if it has to work on both sides, like how are you, yeah. I mean, I, I, this is a question for everybody in a way, like how are you thinking about things like that? This is a thing that I've been playing with in my head, Nick, I think you just, you know, put it so correctly and maybe that's a theory that I need, but I've been calling it this XR bridge where we're gonna be bringing these worlds together and these audiences together. And how do we make it meaningful for both of them? And that is the core of everything that we're doing. So that's part of the reason we're trying all these experiments out tonight so we can find ways to learn from this and then embody them. You know, these are just etchings and sketches right now about what we want to do. And then how can we find ways to really embody them in this medium and virtualize them and make them incredibly powerful and interactive and make sense for, for groups of people that are having these different experiences at different levels. Is it purely observational? Is it totally interactive? Is there something in between? And those are all the things that we really have to play with and figure out. Alyssa, do you want to speak to that as well? I was just going to say that, you know, it's all very well to talk about tossing thunderbolts around and everything. But um, at the end of the day, I think it's very important to simplify because you know, we're all used to, to VR and so, but what we forget and what we have to constantly keep in mind is that a lot of people aren't, and this is an incredibly, incredibly rich world and their senses are literally being inundated for people who have not done a lot of VR. It's incredible. You're looking around and you're going to miss a lot of um, the lines. You're going to miss some of the action just because your attention is elsewhere. It's like being in a, 
an absolutely amazing, um, incredible fictional world that you're getting to visit. So I think that that's uh, an important element always to keep in mind that it needs to be simple. The interactions need to be very clear, very easily understood and fun, but simple. So simplify, simplify. So it's at the beginning, you think really big and we can do this and we can do that. And we can do the other. And then at the end of the day, they can do one thing. So what is that one thing? And is, what is the most effective one thing that they're going to do during this scene or that they're going to see during this scene? Just to add on one thing about that, that the list you reminded me of is how important it is, especially with something that essentially is a, is a new hybrid art form about teaching the audience how to engage with it from the beginning mm -hmm. that onboarding experience that we talk about, like, and, and that it's something that's important. I think anytime that you're performing something, especially for live events, but I think especially for this, there is an opportunity um, to really uh, have an audience that's very receptive to being shown new rules than they've ever had uh, going to a performance before, whether that's at home or in a, in an actual space. And uh, so, you know, how we kind of lay out those cards really simply as you're kind of putting it, Alyssa, at, from the get-go really, I think, helps to shape both individuals and audiences as a group, follow you wherever you end up going, even if you go to some places where you're layering in a lot of uh, information visually, sonically, and otherwise. Well, that's, that's terrific. I'm really, like, I'm, I'm just, just I'm going to selfishly say how happy I am that we ended on the note that this is, like, cutting edge and that we're all kind of experimenting with it, trying to figure out like what is simple, what is clear, what is what is what is powerful and not confusing. So thank you so much for having me and thank you for so much for allowing me to be part of this conversation. It's 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 really like if I can just say it for myself, I think it's really fascinating experimentation and I'm very excited to see so many smart people working on it. Thank you, Nick, Thanks. for joining. Thank you everyone for joining. And I think that's it for tonight. So for those of you who have Facebook questions, we will get back to those on Facebook. You can continue to interact with us there. Um, for those of you more curious about Culture Hub's work and these experiments in visual storytelling, follow them on Facebook, uh, their website, culturehub.org, our website, double-i.co. We've got a newsletter you can sign up for and we can share updates with you about the upcoming production on May 16th. So we'll be showing more from Pandora X further experiments, more things we'll be trying. And thank you so much. Uh, back to Maddie. Yes, thank you so much to everybody who joined us, um, moderator, actors, technologists, writers. It's so cool to have everybody together. Um, and I really get the sense that Double I is a team figuring this out, which is really nice. And I'm sure you're very, very grateful to it. Um, to everyone who's been watching, thank you so much. I think it's it's so valuable for us to do these open rehearsals. Um, but you know, the thing that I've really been missing with doing live streams and doing this sort of work is that afterwards we don't brush shoulders and say, "Oh, that was really cool how you did that," or "I didn't quite understand this," or you know, just sharing your favorite moments. So I wonder if there's a way that we can find a way to share those things together um, in this platform because we're just, we're all trying to learn together. And just like Alyssa was saying, it's it's sort of in, deeply important to understand what, what communicates um, and what resonates. So we hope that, uh, you know, maybe you can let us know what you think. Um, and thanks for joining us on this experiment. I, we hope you'll come back in May. Thank you, Kira. Thank Thanks for having your mama. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good night. <laughs>